Yeah, so I think we often think of being bored as, you know, oh, I'm bored or I'm either, I'm either bored or not bored, but there's lots of different ways to be not bored. So in my right. research, I like distinguish a lot between things that are enjoyable, but not very interesting, which might be like the 10,000th like reboot of a series that like we've all seen over and over and over. Right. Um, and enjoyable things are familiar, they're rewarding. It's kind of a simple pleasure. Right. But there's also things that are interesting and something can be enjoyable, but not interesting, like, you know, a mindless game on your phone or like the 10,000th like Marvel movie, maybe, right, you right, know, depending right. on, you know, you know. Right. But, and things can be interesting, but not enjoyable. So like watching a documentary about the Holocaust or watching the news about what's going on in Ukraine, those things are really interesting. They're not necessarily pleasant and they don't necessarily feel good. They're valuable, they're not boring, but they're not necessarily enjoyable. And so I think when we think about what people want and you know, if you think about asking viewers what they want, we don't always realize that there's this distinction that there are things that we're gonna enjoy, but they're are gonna be not that interesting and kind of boring in that respect. Mm -hmm. There are also things that are gonna be interesting, but those things that are interesting are probably going to challenge us. They may make us uncomfortable. They may make us feel bad in certain ways. Those things are also not boring, but they ask more of an audience uh, because to find something interesting, you have to make sense of it. You have to work at it. So enjoyable media is fun and easy and you don't have to work at it necessarily. Interesting media asks more of the audience and asks the audience to do some of that work along with you. And I think that can be challenging on the production side to like be like, are we going to ask our audience how much? How much can we ask our audience? And will the audience put in the work that's necessary to really get you know that interesting bit out of it? So I think there's really this interesting divide between those two, an tension between those two right. desires. Well, I'm curious because you because you brought something up that that actually reminded me of something that um. That, that happened fairly recently so for example like with the oscars um which i i still keep up with here but the one major change that occurred every if i recall this year was where they started to allow the general audience rather than the uh the academy members to do a vote for the the various uh, nominations they have for all these different type of uh um uh awards they would give out but this year if i recall correctly they had uh, started to give the audience the opportunity for them to vote on uh, something kind of trivial. I mean, at least to me, it seemed somewhat trivial, like, you know, what's the best action film and some of that sort. Right. Yeah, yeah. And they were legitimately giving out Oscars for, for the, for the general public, uh, for the general audience members to watch and have, a, uh, have a, uh, a, a chance to partake in, the, in this uh, ceremony here in that respect. But what I noticed though, is that um, I was always a big proponent of, you know, it's going to sound probably not the best way to, for me to say it, but I don't know any way going around it. But sometimes I think that what the audience wants, they're not, they're not really sure. Yeah. Therefore, I think there's a lot of things about how studios, they make these uh, assumptions that, you know, Fast and Furious is doing, is done very well. And then obviously another studio wants to make another Fast and Furious movie because that's what the audience wants. So when they have, uh, in this case here, when they allow the audience to vote in their their take on what they thought was the best of whatever the, whatever was the nominations they were allowed to partake in here, something about this didn't seem like it clicked with me because what I noticed is that they were just voting on things that seemed very mundane, mm -hmm. and it didn't have a real impact. For example, like if you nominate an actor of for for best actor for a picture that they had done, and you give the opportunity for the audience to vote for that it's not going to go very well because some of the audience are not very seasoned in that respect of what they're looking out for, for highlighting certain things. So I started to notice for myself as of late, especially as of late, I would say in the last, I would say two years or a year and a half where you can't really depend on the audience to make that distinction about what exactly is the best option for them until it's presented to them. And then they decide on the spot for them to figure it out. Because if you, when, you, when you look at a movie, for example, like I brought the thing before with somebody else, where when it came out back in the 80s, no one saw it and it was ridiculed by critics. And then years and years and years later, it's now considered a masterpiece. It's a wonderful film and everyone has such high regard for that movie. Uh, but it took a while to get to that point. But, it, but 
the people that picked up on it did not see it in theaters. They picked it up on watching it at home. And then that's where the attention started to get more and more awareness here. So, but again, I'm not sure if, if boredom has anything to do with that per se, because I think that a lot of times when they, when I see something, I think there's a lot of preconceived notion behind what they expect and what they want, but they have no idea what they really want. And it's sometimes when you ask an audience member or even our reviewers, uh, you'll ask them, um, cause I'd, I'd review too. Why didn't you like the movie? It was boring. But when you go to a specific set of details about what is it about boring, it's not the most articulate answers that you get from them. It's very like the acting was terrible and it wasn't very good. And the story was so boring, but, but what about the specifics that you notice about those areas that were so boring? And they've, in my opinion, most of the time don't do a really good job in elaborating on those answers there. So I'm wondering if the boredom also comes from other areas. Cause you, that's why I was, I was really interested in talking to you about that because I, I think there's a lot more in depth aspect that I found very interesting with what you talked about before, but when it comes to general audience reacting to certain things, it seems like the filmmakers understand it, but the audience member doesn't. Therefore, we know better. Therefore, we should, we're going to make what they, we want and they'll figure it out along the way. But if they don't respond, then they're out of a job. So it's a yeah. very fickle thing. No, I, I love that. There's classic work in social psychology that mm. people cannot tell you why they like or don't like a thing. They literally, there's no conscious access to it. It's uh, the classic paper is called Telling More Than We Can Know. And there's all these awesome studies where they basically deliberately put people in like good moods and bad moods. So the researchers knew why right. they were actually in a good or bad mood, but then they'd ask the participants like, Hey, like, why do you feel bad? And people just make stuff up. Uh, we, right. It's called um, um, confabulating, which is just such a great word, which is mm. when you put people on the spot and I say like, Hey, like, why didn't you like that movie? Or, Hey, why are you in a bad mood? Or, Hey, like, you know, why did that book not resonate with you? We immediately start generating theories for why we might've felt that way. But that doesn't mean that those theories are accurate. They're just sort of our, they reflect our lay beliefs about the world. We don't have any direct like self insight or access. When you talk about those audience members, like saying like, Oh, it was boring. It probably was boring to them, but they probably can't tell us why. And that's probably why those answers are so unsatisfying that, you know, there's this classic study where they had the same instructor get up in front of a class and he was either really friendly to all the students or really kind of acted like a real jerk. And they asked the students later, like, what do you think of that teacher? And even though the teacher did everything exactly the same, they thought the jerk teacher was like, ugly and unattractive and like a bad teacher and didn't know what he was doing. And they claimed that was why they didn't like him. But actually they thought all those things, they were coming up with reasons to justify their dislike that really were completely not the case because that would, person was just the same when they were being a nice guy. So we don't know. And so when you hear people, you know, be like, oh, like the acting was bad or I don't like that person or I don't mm. like these storylines. Um, it's interesting to see why people think they don't like it, but we really shouldn't believe them. We shouldn't really take their word for it that they really know. And so, you know, you know, on like the production side, if you're like talking to an audience and you're like, wow, why did that movie flop? Oh, it was too, com they said it was too complicated. That doesn't actually mean it was too complicated or like, right. oh, there wasn't a star. That, that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with why it didn't resonate with people. And, um, I really love the point you make about how, you know, this idea of putting media out there and letting people sort of take time to come to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, this idea that some things are interesting but not enjoyable. Paul Sylvia is a social psychologist who's done a lot of work on like what it means to find something interesting. And he has this delightful quote I love, which is that feeling interested in something is about those things which we don't yet understand, but which are understandable and that we feel like we can understand them, which right. means that a really complicated new movie, like, you know, something like, uh, what, what's the one that just came out? Like everything, everywhere, all at once. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. asking a lot of the audience, you know, and yeah. to walk away from that film and be like, wow, like I just, you know, saw something incredible. 
you you have to put in the work but you also have to have sort of like the background and skill to like make sense of all of these things that the film is throwing at you right. and that's something that you know some of us who have like watched lots of film may be ready to do and it may be something that you know if you watch it two or three times you're like oh i'm getting it now you know this is yeah. like working um but it's totally possible that like fantastic like art if you just sort of throw it at an audience that isn't prepared for it, they may just not be ready to to take it in and comprehend it and make sense of it. And so instead of being like, oh my God, wow, like this like is a mind blowing piece of art. Instead, they're just like, what the heck did I just see? Like, right. what is that like, right. you know, you know, artsy garbage or whatever. Um, and and yeah, that's that's hard, I think, for the like filmmakers and folks who are like, you know, producing and making things because I don't think they're wrong to worry that audiences may need time to appreciate it. Like they probably yeah, I've I've talked to quite a few people in the industry, um, you know, both on you know here on camera and also in private as well too. And, and a lot of things that I've I've come across with a lot of these filmmakers and that are working on these projects they're trying to develop here and and i understand you know there's there's a number of different factors that have to start off the project to get it off you know to get it up and running but even when you get the project done um you know you have you go to a distributor and the distributor is saying well in order for us to be able to release this film in this market we have to take out x y and z because the audience over there will not respond and that to me because uh, i once i started learning more about this here i didn't realize that like, for example, there was a movie that I did a review for a while back. It's called Bull Shark. But before it was called Blood in the Water. But when the distributors got a hold of the film, they said, well, we can't release this movie under the name Blood in the Waters because it has a negative connotation in some other markets there where mm -hmm. we can't release it simply off the name alone. The name alone was the reason why they couldn't release it until they changed it. So little things like that, uh, which I started to realize that sometimes the most mundane thing that you think has no effect on anybody has the biggest effect on other people outside of, you know, this country or whatever country may be. But I also started to realize too, along the way that when it came across some people who have talked with distributors about what they want to release, the most common thing they come across is that we need more of this. You know, we need to have, basically they're adding supplements to be able to make the, the film more appealing, but we want you to add all this stuff here, but we need to do it by tomorrow. Oh and you know, th yeah, that's kind of like the, yeah. the condensed version of this here. But, but the thing is, is that I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that the, the distributors are really more adamant about what can appeal to the audience so they don't get bored. And Roger Corman is very famous for, uh, who produced like, uh, um, chopping mall and, and, and several other uh, indie films, but the, the, he made a point about, you got to have an explosion every 15 minutes and you got to have something of this sort of come out every 10 minutes or whatever the case may be. It's always something that has to be happening to keep the audience's attention. And he was very fully aware of that. And he's done fairly well, I would say, for someone to be able to maintain a long career to the point where he's influenced a lot of other filmmakers who have uh, done very well for themselves in their own respective uh, careers. But I, I started to notice that when it comes to the audience's attention span, I noticed that it's getting a lot shorter more and more as the years have gone by. And I'm wondering if it's because are they getting bored of the amount of noise that's going around and they just can't keep up with it and they're just shutting it down. And then how do you appeal to those people? And that's virtually everyone else out there. And I think um, when I have, when I've listened to a lot of these filmmakers talk about their experiences in making the movie and what they intended on making and then what came out of it because of other different factors that kind of alter their, their vision for whatever those reasons may be, it's because at the end of the day, they don't want the audience to get bored and they want the audience to be excited for it and pay for the product. Yeah. Um, and I understand the, the, the business aspect of it as well too, which is why I was, like I said before, I was really curious about hearing your perspective on that because when I thought, because when you hear people talk and you kind of brought up something that's really important that I thought was really important highly is that unless a person has no background and be able to articulate those thoughts, that's going to be something that the, that the studios and the producers and distributors have to be dealing with here that everyone just doesn't get it therefore we're just going to make it digestible for them to get it so that way they can say i love it why did you because like? the action was fantastic good that's all we need to know that's the sound bite that we need i personally do have a problem with it and not that i'm going out of my way to make the change for it but i'm curious to see from your perspective do you think there's a way for that to change 
for an, the the general going audience here to figure out the time they need to develop to invest and to be able to understand the backstory about what it took took to make the movie because most people don't care but they do care about they care about what they enjoy it's in front of them but they don't care about the events that led up to it and the events that, that follow after that so i'm curious to see about your perspective on how all that would apply for them to be able to find a way for them to be interested and not pre have the preconceived notion of being bored of the or anticipated being bored because they don't want to care for all the other stuff of what led up to it and the things that have led up after the fact here too. So I know it's a lot of long question, but I hope you understand where I was referring to that. No, that's really interesting because there's sort of these two pieces that go into whether you feel bored to begin with. And part of it is absolutely just like raw attention. Like, you know, when you're sitting watching that film or reading that book or whatever it is you're doing, mm -hmm. is your attention actually on it? Like, do you feel right. like your attention is there? And attention can go astray for all kinds of reasons. Uh, you know, you could just be distracted and have other stuff going on. But the ways that usually people start to have trouble with attention is either there's not enough happening. So that's the, it's been 21 minutes and there's no explosion yet. You know, like yeah, yeah. the sort of under stimulation. People can also have trouble though paying attention when there's too much going on. So like if yeah. like it's confusing and like it's like, okay, like, people kind of just sort of peace out. Like I, I can't, I don't, I can't even follow what's going on anymore. So there's this like sweet spot with attention that, and it's interesting, the idea of like an explosion every 15 minutes, because in teaching, we're told that like something new should happen every like 10 to 15 minutes, like in a right. two hour lecture, you want to play a video or like switch topics that like, there is something I think about that 15 minute or so attention span where if things stay the same people start to sort of okay been there done that this makes sense like what's new and you want it i don't know that it has to be an explosion per se but there probably does need to be something that changes that pulls the audience back in unless of course they have and i don't know that you can really do this other than something like you know, folks who are already interested in film, but I'm thinking about like long form, like movies that are just like shot in like a single, you know, a single like take. Set. Yeah, a single yeah. take or a single set where it's like, it's almost the exact opposite of that. It's like asking people to maintain attention almost kind of unnaturally for a really extended period. And that's part of the art of it, right? It's that it's right. like extended meditation and meditation is hard for people. Yeah. Um, and then the other the other part of so attention is totally just part of what makes something boring. You want that sweet spot. You want people engaged, and everyone tends to struggle with that if you're not switching things up. Even though there are maybe more and less subtle ways of doing that, you know, right. may also be a you know just a different thing means of doing that. Uh, but it does bring me to the other. Point you kind of touch on about like people's appreciation of like what goes into you know what they're watching because the other thing that matters with boredom is not just like whether or not you can pay attention I'm sure we've all like I'm sure you had the experience where like I can pay attention just fine I just like don't care about what's happening like yeah, you know yeah. whatever like yeah. all right there's the 10,000th explosion and the, the car went on fire again mm -hmm. like all right whatever I just don't care and we call that sort of this meaning component that yeah, you need to be able to be paying attention, you need that sweet spot of attention. But when we have your attention, what you're paying attention to needs to feel meaningful. And we have this kind of tendency to think about meaning and this like big M, capital meaning in life, like things are objectively meaningful or not, but meaning is super personal. Like what's meaningful to you is gonna be different than what's meaningful to me. Right. And so if you're trying to, you know, think about, you know, an audience or viewers or readers, and you're thinking about like, what is going to be meaningful to people? That answer is going to be a little bit different for every single person. And so I think what often happens is we make decisions to, you know, either I'm going to go with something that's meaningful on average to most people, like romantic relationships are meaningful, to right. most people, you know, like, mm -hmm. and that's one route. You can also go like really particular, you know, like I'm really going to like, zero in on like the fans of this particular thing and do some fan service and I know that's only going to resonate with like five percent of the the audience right. but that five percent is gonna like 
speed it up. You know, yeah. it's going to like really matter. And they'll it. amplify it too for those yeah. that aren't aware of it as well. Exactly. So yeah. Yeah. Exactly. They can like bring in the meaning for people that don't have it. So like, I think I, I mentioned the Marvel stuff earlier. I like am terrible. I, the very first Marvel movie I watched was, um, um, like I think like the 10th one or something that came out not having seen any of them and I just was sitting in the theater and I was like what is happening and yeah. I can tell I was like I can tell that something important but this matters because like everything just slowed down and there's this really like dramatic music and I'm like I should care about who this person is uh but I don't know who it is but I had a friend that went with me which is why I went who was leaning over and like whispering like you know like the yeah, yeah. The footnotes kind of yeah, like, yeah, yeah. that's so-and-so and this matters because like we thought he was dead you know or what you know whatever and i'm like <laughs> oh like really important context to like yeah finding this experience meaningful and so you know maybe that answers your your question in some ways that fan communities and folks that do appreciate what goes into the, the movie and goes into the art. Like that's never going to be everybody, mm -hmm. but most works have like some group of people that really care. And to the extent that those people can communicate that to others and be like, hey, this is really cool because like, you know, they've been trying to make this film for 10 years and it keeps, you know, like, like giving that yeah. additional context. And that's something right. we know about meaning is that context is like super important and that's what takes something from boring to interesting it's like all of a sudden this completely mundane shot is now like super meaningful because i know about the background that went into it and so finding ways of getting that background to people whether it's through you know sort of that peer lateral like uh movement like hearing it from other folks who are watching right it, to watch it or whether it's coming in some ways from producers i think there are ways to probably some really cool marketing ways of doing that of like conveying what went into this and certainly i think the rise of like behind you know like the behind the scenes like right. us you know supplementary material and stuff like i grew up before dvds so i just remember how like mind-blowing that was yeah you know? same for me yeah oh my god like, yeah. the, like there's like it's it's exactly a lot of that context of like yeah what went into making this movie and like I, it was that was a mind-blowing sort of it's an experience, I would yeah. say, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and so I think taking advantage of that and, you know, taking an active role in both facilitating that, like, peer-to-peer -peer and audience-to-audience -audience communication, you know, whether that's creating forums for people to talk about it or, like, social media groups or just, like, places for that to happen, but also just direct messaging, you know? If there's a really cool, interesting background to what you did and the work you did, like, don't keep it a secret. Um, if you let people know, that's going to make it more meaningful to them. And I don't know that there's a way for people, you know, I'm thinking of like just sort of like a general audience member who like, you know, doesn't really know much about what they're watching, may not have other folks who are into it that just, you know, show up and watch a movie. Um, there's not really any way for them to spontaneously get that information other than going out to search for it, which probably most people aren't going to do. So I, I think in some ways, what you're asking is is an education question. And right. honestly, it's what you're doing right now, right? With like your YouTube channel in some ways that yeah. you're, you're speaking to people and telling people like, hey, look, these things you love and enjoy, there's a lot that goes into this beyond what, you know, the final product that you enjoy. At home. Right. Well, the thing is, is that um, I believe that yeah, I, I don't. Well, maybe I'm I'm kind of being too optimistic, but I I do believe that if people know more about the background, there's a lot that they can take away from that too. And I understand some people are because I myself am included. Because when it comes to video games, I, it's not my cup of tea. It's not something that I'm very interested. In, but I do know the hard work that goes into that. Um, but personally, I don't really care to delve into it too much unless um, it's something that I have some sort of personal investment to be uh, attracted to that. But even with that, though, like I understand that there are certain things that I can be aware of that could help me personally understand the the concept behind what it took to make whatever the video game is that would be brought to my attention. But I also feel like, though, that because most people nowadays who are because, you know, everything's accessible now, you have multiple platforms to be able to watch various movies that would be very difficult to find um, and now are accessible, you know, in a snap of a finger and you can watch it 
at the comfort of your own home on your phone. But the problem that I started to notice too, is that there's an oversaturation of that as well, where I'm a very big proponent for indie filmmakers. Like I love majority of indie films that are out there, but when I watch a lot of indie movies, there's maybe the film may not be as great, but the idea, the direction, the, the, the story that they were going for was really, really good. They're just all the other things that they try to put together didn't turn out so well. But when you come to find out, well, well we didn't have the budget for this here. So we had to make a makeshift this and that. He said, that's genius. I didn't think about that. Now that you did that, imagine if you had funds to do that, what you could have done. That to me is much more interesting, you know, than, than having someone to say the movie sucked. And why did it suck? Because it was just uh, the, 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 ter- the sets were awful. And then they had this terrible looking camera. You can tell it wasn't very good. That's all they could afford. And that was the best they could do. And that to me is really, really important to educate people on that. If they don't like the movie, even despite knowing that and they respect it, I'm cool with that. But, you know, then again, I can't make the presumption that audience will be the, that any person will be understanding of that because I think most people just don't care. But, you know, but I guess I'm just like, I don't care. I'm going to, I'm going to keep putting it out there, but that's just my perspective here. But what I'm really curious though, for you to, to commentate on is because, um, I'm starting to notice as well that when it comes to the concerns that most people have, when I'm talking about concerns, I'm talking about the concerns of like the, the studio heads, the distributors, that they're looking for the next big thing because they, will, they again, they don't want people to be bored of what's coming out right now. So every once in a while, you get that one film that comes out, like Avatar is a big example when it came out back in 09. If you look at the story, everyone kept comparing it to Fern Gully or Dances yeah. with the Wolves because it was exactly the same plot, but the supplements that went with the plot and the 3D and the, uh, the, the 3D uh, animation, all that stuff helped make the film that much more enjoyable. But the plot synopsis was very basic. And, and it did so well that to this day, you know, obviously with the re-release, of course, it may, it's considered the most highest grossing film of all time. But they added those additional supplements. But that's something that James Cameron, who was very, very cognizant of him and, and making sure that I want to tell this story, but I want to tell it like this, but it's not going to be easy to do. So he had to wait a long time to get to that point. And even now with the sequel coming out later this year, it took a long time to tell, to be able to get that film put together. But now that the anticipation for the movie is coming out, where people have seen the trailer in 3D, they're like, this looks beautiful. Already the excitement is already up another level here because they have the previous experience they've had because they already had that preconceived notion. And now they can anticipate something even better from what they've seen so far from that small snippet of it there. So it's, it's interesting for me that certain mundane things that most people will tend to criticize seem to enjoy when there's additional supplements added to that as well, too. But it's not easy to figure out what that is that can make the audience be excited for it because you have to have all the gears in place to be able to have a really good product. So I'm curious about your perspective on these, these additional supplements you keep having to add just to keep people interested. Is it worth it? And if it is worth it, do you think it can be that people will be worn out in, in time eventually because it's already been overdone and therefore there has no meaning behind it anymore because we can see they're just trying to, to continue with that, but there's no substance behind it. I think James Cameron and the people involved with the films, are really considering those those uh, criticisms and they're understanding that we have to do something that's making it worth the audience's while to want to come back, which is why I think they took so long to get to that point there. So again, I hope the question wasn't too long, but I hope you understand where I'm coming from with that as well. Yeah, I I think there's sort of a, a cheap strategy of keeping people's attention because novel things draw our attention, even if it's, you know, the same story we've heard in 20,000 ways, but now I put right. on 3D glasses to see it. Right. I think the trouble with like, I'll call them cheap tricks kind of mm-hmm. to keep attention is exactly what you're saying. It's like, there's not any real meaning to them. And so if you're relying solely on novelty, it's only gonna work a couple of times, right? right? Like, right. and so I think it is tricky to take, you know, there's only so many stories really, you mm-hmm. know, there's work on that, you know, there's, there's really only a few sort of patterns. A lot of what makes something meaningful is in the details. Um, and novelty isn't the only way to make something interesting. Uh, complexity is as well that like, mm-hmm. especially when we take common stories and we tell them in ways that make us 
rethink what we knew or rethink that like that story that we thought was so familiar or like we see this common story but now all of a sudden we it like hits home in a new way right and those aren't cheap tricks those are ways of finding and they may be novel ways um but the point isn't the novelty the point is finding ways to make novel connections that create meaning for the person experiencing it and so i think when you think about like avatar like there's two ways to kind of think about like the sort of 3dness of it you can think of it as this sort of like cheap trick like oh it's just like a flashy new thing and it's like sort of like a carnival like people will do it and they'll get bored of it another way to think about it and i think this is something to me at least that cameron leaned into is okay here is this like new novel thing 3d movies how can we use this tool to give people an immersive narrative experience in a way that they have like not experienced before that really dials up that connection with what they're seeing so that they don't it's sort of eliminating some of that distance between you and the screen where like you feel like you're part of the story and that's that same technology that can be used in two totally different ways you know it's a tool um And so I think on the one hand, as long as you're trying to come up with sort of like new cheap tricks that are just relying on novelty and like, oh, people haven't experienced this before, so it's going to catch their attention. Right. Um, Yeah, that is an arms race you're going to lose in the end because you have to keep ramping it up because it has to be new. But if you're using new tools for sort of an old purpose of building connection and building connection in ways that people might not have expected or anticipated or experienced before um you can use new tools for that but you can also use old tools what matters is finding new connections for people to make and i think there's a million new connections to make because the world is changing um the stories that we tell today aren't the same as the stories that we told you know in the 1950s or the 1900s or like the 1700s and so as long as people keep changing and the world keeps changing there's always going to be new connections and new meaning to be made. And so I think from that perspective, it doesn't have to be an arms race. It's, it's something more like, like a quest to keep finding ways of, of talking and expressing these new, you know, ways of being and thinking with the audience that's engaging with it. And that's much more meaningful. Um, And using new tools that leverage that and let you do that, it's really not about the novelty of the tool. It's it's what that tool lets you do. And so I think that is really the distinction that you don't you don't have to keep ramping it up unless you're just relying on the novelty of the thing itself. If you're using it to build connection, then there are a million ways to to do that and probably ways that like we're gonna keep being surprised by and refreshed by and and that's great. What do you, what's your take on when, it, when you see, for example, like when, you know, when Marvel came out, Marvel practically changed the landscape of Hollywood where it's, it's almost guaranteed any film that they release is going to make a lot of money. And, and that's the expectation now that every film they're releasing is going to make a lot of money to the point where several other studios have followed suit and more or less creating their own respective universes in their, you know, under their umbrella where they anticipated that since Marvel's doing it, we can do it too. Because like, for example, one of the biggest, biggest examples is when uh, Universal, who owns all the Universal Monsters, they try to make more or less a Universal Monsters Avengers movie by starting off with the Tom Cruise mummy film. And how I still have yet to see the movie. And I'm a big Tom Cruise fan, but I have yet to see the film because it just didn't capture my attention. But the fact that they had Tom Cruise in there was clearly a, 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 a step in the path of more or less starting everything. So they're basically putting all their eggs in one basket with this movie. And they even went ahead and announced that we've got Javier Bardem as Frankenstein, John, Johnny Depp as, uh, as the invisible man. Um, Angelina Jolie is going to be bride of Frankenstein and several other actors as well. Too, if I can recall, and Russell Crowe was going to be Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, which he was in that movie in the mummy, but they were clearly anticipating that we're going to be great big stars. We're going to pay them a lot of money and people are going to know these stars. And they're going to be interesting seeing these stars in these respective roles, but we're going to present it in the form of a superhero rather than, you know, what we've come, what we've been accustomed with, uh, with the previous films. 
and it went nowhere yeah. to the point where it just they completely oh you know we were going to shoot the movie uh this fall but we had to rewrite the script so they have all this bs um announced about what had happened and why they're postponing and reality they just didn't want to make the film because the movie didn't make any money so again when you have a lot of when you see when you hear stuff like that for yourself where the negotiate the business side of, of the things here where they're depending on the audience to, to continue riding on that train that they are hopping off of marvel here and then they're going to say we're going to do that with universal monsters we're going to want them to follow suit with us as well too and we know they will because we've got the big stars and they've lost a lot more money than they gained back so i'm curious to see about what's your perspective on trying to keep the audience's attention in that respect where in a lot of ways i wouldn't say it's, it's a desperate move but i feel like it was more of a a move they thought get it while the iron's hot and we want to make sure we stay on it while it's still hot until something else changes along the way. Meanwhile, Universal does have, I believe they have, yeah, they have uh, Fast and the Furious, which is doing very well. Yeah. And and they want to continue on adding on more franchises uh, for obvious reasons. And I understand the reasons behind that. But again, I'm curious to hear your perspective on how they're attempting to try to capture the audience's attention by what's already been done before and just doing it on their in their in their respective ways. I think it's an enjoyment strategy. So if you think really, this is way oversimplifying things, but if you think about it as like going for the enjoyment strategy versus sort of the interest strategy, like we're gonna make just an enjoyable film that like people will like know that they're going to come and they're gonna have a good time. Um, enjoyment is about simple, reliable things that have been enjoyable in the past. Right. It's sort of about reward history, if you wanna think about it mm -hmm. in those terms. And so from that perspective, like Marvel is a jackpot because so many of us grew up with it as kids. Right. And so when we become adults, they, they did, they timed it perfectly um, mm -hmm. that like, you know, we're teens and 20 somethings. And then they start that and it's like, oh my God, these are, I love these when I was a kid. They don't, they didn't have to build that came for free in some ways. True. And then all you have to do in that case is not mess up the original movies. And so I think the idea of like Universal using the monster movies missed the whole premise of what people find enjoyable. Right. Um, most of us don't have childhood sentimental attachments to like the mummy or Frankenstein or, right. you know, which means that to, to build up that reward history, they have to make a first movie that just like catches fire. And I don't, I don't think they quite did that. Um, versus fast and the furious like well it literally caught fire. but you know what i mean like it's yeah, like yeah. that like it yeah. did and so then people are like wow i loved that i want more of that oh here's fast and the furious too you know oh i loved that i want more of that here's fast and the furious three but you have to start to, to sort of pursue that strategy you have to start with people having this strong positive association with it like Oh yeah, I loved it. It was easy. I just really enjoy it. And you either gonna have to generate that in sort of your like first film, or um, you're going to have to build the first sort of film in a way that capitalizes on that pre-existing sentiment. So I actually think Stranger Things on Netflix is a great example of this. Yeah, I agree too. That it 100% took advantage of the nostalgia that a lot of folks in our age group have for that time and then yeah. did a really good job with season one and then they're off um and so i i think you really you need that there if you're i also think stranger things is more interesting but yeah. if you're going to sort of go for that, <laughs> that that repeat sort of if you want that repeat franchise right you need to have this positive strong reward history and if you don't have that simply i think throwing you know, famous people at it and high budgets isn't going to cut it. That's not giving people, it's not scratching that itch of like, you know, I'm going to sit back and enjoy it. And I love this thing. And, and I know I love it. And I've always loved it. And like, it doesn't even matter if the next dose isn't that great. It's still yeah. this thing I love. That's what the, that was one of the biggest, uh, I think, criticisms about the Transformer movies too, where the first one did very well. And then each one got bigger and bigger in terms of budget. And even with the box office returns, with the exception, maybe the last one that came out. Um, because I think a lot of people were criticizing the franchise because they were saying that it's nothing to do really with the actual essence of Transformers. It became a giant commercial. Yeah. 
at a very expensive one at that as well too but they made a lot of money so they just kept continuing that same trajectory what they have already started with before and the films in my opinion weren't necessarily getting any better they're actually kind of getting worse but they kept adding other supplements let's bring mark Wahlberg this time for the fourth film oh my god he's back and he's you know and that, people, that got me invested because i'm a big Wahlberg fan i thought maybe with his say on the matter he'll have some insight and uh, he'll have some um input about what he wants to do with the story and it was the exact same thing that we got in the previous film that didn't really do much for me at all yeah. so you know i think um i understand when it comes to how people uh, look at certain things like stranger things you brought up before was a really good example where you know you know i I was born in the eighties. I grew up from all the leftovers from the eighties and in, in the nineties and then going up to this day, my son, on the other hand, obviously didn't grow up in the eighties, but he knows stranger things now because he saw the influences that it had. So to some degree, he would ask me questions about, was it kind of like the eighties? Well, I remember like this and so on. So there's a lot of different elements that he can take from that, that use me as a point of reference if he cares to ask, but that's the whole purpose, I believe. So I also think that uh, when you pointed out about Stranger Things being the the that one nugget that everyone happened to take notice of here, it also created a genre in itself where now people are comparing is it like Stranger Things now? But Stranger Things was influenced heavily by Stephen King films and a lot of the 80s films that came out of that era. And now it's its own more or less genre where people have identified it as that way to even the point where kids who never grew up in that era solely look at stranger wow. things and they don't and they the point of reference is stranger things not the films that came before yeah. that so i find yeah. that to be extremely interesting as well too yeah. so but i guess uh because i know we're gonna be closing up here but i i was curious if you can give me one last uh, insight about your perspective on this year because the way things are looking right now when it when it comes to the marketing of films especially now with the climate where representation is out there is, is a major thing and in turn you start to see every once in a while a film come out that wasn't expected to make a lot of money and then made the money. And then all of a sudden you don't see a film of that sort happen for a very long time, despite the reception, despite the box office returns that it got. So I'm curious about, you know, when you look at a film, say for example, like crazy rich Asian, which came out was did huge numbers. We haven't seen another film of that sort for quite some time. And what we did probably didn't do as well, but it was well received. So obviously there's a marketing that also comes with that as well too. But clearly there was a moment where the audience did respond to that. And yet for some reason, those aren't the films that are being made more often, but we're said we're getting more Transformers, more Marvel films and things of that nature. So I'm curious to see about what the distinction is for yourself and how you see where Marvel movies, DC films do a lot very well, but crazy rich Asian type films don't necessarily get much traction after the initial release. I, I honestly think it partly has to do with who's producing movies and right. what what they see as normative. That something like Transformers fits with like a very sort of white male centric, you know, view mm -hmm. of like what the media is. And so we know that people feel more comfortable when things are more fluent and more stereotype consistent things are more fluent. And so I suspect that like some part of it is that films like Crazy Rich Asians, they don't fit that stereotype. And so like, yes, they did well, but people are, and I'm saying people, the people in power uh, tend mm -hmm. to be resistant to that. And like, not that they necessarily don't consciously want it to be true, but it doesn't fit with what they expect. And it doesn't fit with their sort of like prototype of what a successful film is. And one of the strongest things we see in psychology is that when that happens, when you show people like you think the world is one way, you think certain types of films make money, and then you show them evidence that like, hey, this thing that this other thing actually did fantastic, but it doesn't fit with your sort of like expectations. Uh, it causes cognitive dissonance and people are fantastic at justifying and coming up with reasons for why this was like the exception that proved the rule rather than an actual challenge to the rule. And we see this all the time in, you know, you know, if you think of like smokers, for instance, you can tell them all the stats, whatever. And, you know, oh, well, you know, I'm in good health. It's not going to kill me. You know, people uh, yeah, I know are really much. good at like yeah. resisting facts that don't fit in with their idea of how the world works. And because so there's I, not an immediate impact uh, for them to feel those results yeah. that they that people are, are, are warning yeah. them about. 
And like, you know, when you think about something that does make an impact, like Stranger Things, Stranger Things is a really consistent, just like you said, it, it feels like an 80s movie, but like mm -hmm. made with modern production value. And so even though it was new in some ways to the audience that saw it, it fits expectations about what sort of blockbusters can look like. It's, you know, it even demographically, like the folks who are in it are mostly like young white boys, you know, it's like, it's very stereotype consistent with what we sort of in the US think of as mass media and pop media. And I think it's much easier to accept like, oh, this is a surprise money maker and it's legit. It means we should make more things like this versus like, oh, this is a surprise money maker, but it's like weird, quote unquote, and doesn't fit my expectations. And so I'm going to dismiss it and not not use not follow up on it and not try to make another one very interesting yeah i think it's a very unique perspective on that i never really thought of it that way now that you point that out you know it's to me it's very i i find with what you're getting into to be rather unique here because um you know i think uh when when i when i sort of started hearing your 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 conversations about how this study was very important for you and how you found it to be rather interesting considering the subject matter. Yes. But I, I found that, you know, with, you know, because I love entertainment so much, I always feel like there's different aspects of various fields that you can take from to apply to that because, you know, I'm a very big proponent about bringing awareness of like all the various factors that come into making a movie in hopes to, you know, not that I have the ability to do this here, but it helps to educate somebody out there. And I find it really unique to find something that I could take from, in this case, for, or with your background and the studies you have here with, with, with boredom, how that would apply in filmmaking or with films in general for the general growing audience out there. And I, so with what you've been able to share with me uh, during this conversation, it really did kind of ch change my perspective on quite a few things here, some more than others, because I never really considered the fact that um, a person's way of thinking and what they've uh because you mentioned something earlier about things they weren't brought up with here when it comes to how you and i would probably look at something be a little more analytical about certain things they won't have that and i'm not going to say we can blame them for that but we can't blame them for that so there's a perspective about how to articulate that to get them to understand it so everyone comes with you know, talk, talk to them in, at their level now mm -hmm. i understand better what that means as the years have gone by but I appreciate you giving me the time to share that with me because that really did change a lot of how I looked at certain things along the way. Um, but I mean, I'm not sure if there's, if there's anything you want to say in closing with about with what you discuss here, because I think that if, if, if people took a time to hear with what you had to say here, not necessarily just in the entertainment field, but just in general, with regards to your studies here, is there anything that they can look out for you and uh, to anticipate that they could, I know there's a website because I'll be I'll make sure to have all the links in the description down below for people to follow it. But is there anything in particular that you think that if anyone would be interested in following through with you and and use as a starting point to look into what it is you're studying here to help educate them about what we discuss and all the other areas that they could also look into using that as well too to help themselves along the way with that? Yeah, you know, something I always sort of say in closing is you know you can read all the papers and everything but at the end of the day like something like boredom is really quite simple that it's this feeling we have and we're not meaningfully engaged in the world and i think you could take that and like literally even without knowing any of the science behind why we think that's the case when you realize that boredom is a legitimate response when people feel like they can't pay attention or when something feels personally meaningless that you can use that framework in all kinds of things, whether it's entertainment. Um, I talked to a guy um, at Runner's World who's really into running, which I'm like, the world, I don't run. Like, that's just not something I do. Uh, so I was like, I'll talk to you, but you got to tell me about the running half because like, I, I can bring the boredom half, but I know nothing about running. And what I loved was like how simply by being an expert on running that he could tell me these ideas and I could play with, I could tell him this like, basic sort of conception about like boredom is good it's a signal it lets us know that you know things are too easy or too hard or we don't feel a connection to it and he was able to really like map out all the ways that that could matter for running and so I think people underestimate how much they are experts in what they do and how much you can really take really really simple 
principles and extrapolate from there to some really new ideas and really new ways of thinking about like exactly why do we need an explosion every 15 minutes why you know is that about attention is this about novelty so i don't know that people really need to you know you don't need a phd in this in this i think to to take this really basic idea and think about how you apply it to entertainment or running or scuba diving or you know whatever it is that that you care about um that it's it's a powerful idea and it's cool or i find it really enjoyable and I, that's actually why i love having these conversations with folks like you because it challenges me to think about it in different ways and like i haven't thought as much about boredom and entertainment but all the things you bring up i'm like oh my god like there are so many connections here and it's making yeah. me think about entertainment in another way too so i really love that well, I I thank you so much for giving me your time and i appreciate uh, everything you've shared with me here because it really was very helpful for me personally as well to give a new, uh, get a new perspective on certain things here. So again, thank you so much and cheers to you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was not boring at all. <laughs>